Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we are going to be learning a bit about uh, equivalent and resultant loadings. In other words, if you have a distributed load applied to a beam or a column or other structural element, how we can go and approximate that as a single point load. So we're going to be looking at the resultants of distributed loads, replacing them with point loads. We're going to do a bit of review of statics, looking at how we do those, uh, how we find equivalent loads, where we place them, and most importantly, uh, when we can use these. Uh, what, there are certain cases where you can use the resultant force procedure, and there are cases where you cannot, be, you cannot use it. And we'll be investigating those in today's video. So let's look at resultants of distributed forces. Let's look at the resultants of distributed forces. And this one's going to be fairly quick. The whole idea as a review from statics is that we are going to, uh, when finding the resultant of a distributed force, we apply an equivalent load uh, equal to the total, basically equal to the total Uh, magnitude of the distributed load and then we apply it at the centroid of the distributed load. Of that distributed load. All right, so in other words, if you have a, a constant distributed load, just a constant W, let's say you have a constant distributed load uh, with magnitude W, and this is applied over length OA. Let's say length A. If I want to replace that with an equivalent um, point load, or an equivalent resultant, I would apply a load that is of magnitude W times A, really just an area equivalent. You can just multiply these. You can treat these as just integration by area. And so you just have a magnitude W and a length A. So it has a magnitude of W A. And it's going to be applied, because this is a simple rectangle, its centroid is right at its center. And so that's just going to be at A over 2. Uh, from one end of the load. And if you have a triangular load, let's say you have a triangular load, like so, and let's say it has a peak value W, and again, it has length A. Well, I remember basic geometry. I took high school geometry. So I know the area of a triangle is one half base times height. So therefore, the magnitude of a distributed triangular load is simply the, again, the area under the curve effectively. And that would just be length, you know, one half base times height or WA over two. Pretty simple. And if you do, if you run through the centroid calculation, you will determine that this is located at distance a over three from the larger end, from the point, from the side with maximum magnitude. Now, um, you can, if you wish, you can review the statics, the principles of statics used to uh, derive these by integration. You calculate, basically, you calculate the uh, first moment of area, and then you, you divide by the magnitude to get the centroid. But um, if you want to, I would encourage you to review that. I'm not going to go too deeply into depth with that. In this class, you'll probably, you will be fine just looking at the, uh, as long as you can read and interpret a centroid table, uh, you, you'll be fine in um, 
you'll be fine uh, working through the course material. So there are tables you can find, uh, beam tables and such, and just or you can just Google uh, centroid uh, tables that will show you the equivalent um, the equivalent uh, point loads for a series of distributed loads. Also, I would like to know when and when you can and when you can't use these. This is often a topic of uh, confusion for students, and not surprisingly. Because there are certain times you can use this uh, resultant pro uh, or equivalent load process, and there are times that you can't. And eventually with practice, you'll just get an intuitive sense of it. But for now, I'll give you some guidelines. So when can you use the approximate load? Or can resultants be used? I shouldn't say approximate load, I should say, uh, when can resultants of distributed loads be used? Well, what they are primarily good for is finding uh, end forces or restraining forces. They are used to find end forces or restraining forces. In other words, if I have a beam, let's say I have a beam, and I have some sort of distributed load W, and that I would have the function for it, W is a function of x, um, and I wanted to know, let's say, a y and b y. So let's say again, let's say I have a distributed load, and it's varying as some function of x. That could be triangular, it could be constant, it could be parabolic, or whatever it may be. If I want to apply statics to find the end forces, um, let's say, or let's just say I have this. If I want to find, let's say I want to find a y and b y, then yes, can use a resultant method. In other words, I can replace this load with a equivalent point load, maybe a P equivalent, and then run a balance of moments, a sum of forces in the, in the vertical direction, etc., in order to get a Y and B Y. Um, but when can it not be used? When can't we use the uh, equivalent uh, or resultant load method for distributed loads? See when we can't use this. Last thing we'll look at is when we can't use this. And primarily when we want uh, to find anything uh, internally about the beam. So if I want to, for example, let's say I want to find the moment as a function of x and 
the shear as a function of x. Um, let's just look at these two systems. Let's say we have our w, our function, and then maybe an ay and a by. With, and then we have our equivalent, our equivalent resulting system of p equivalent here with a y and b y. Our, our restraining forces, our supports. Well, comparing these two, let's just call this one one and this one two. Um, for let's say a y one is going to be equal to a y two. B y one will also equal B y two. In other words, the supporting forces will be the same whether we're looking at the actual distributed load as a function or whether we're looking at the equivalent point load. That is where we can use it, so that's good. However, if I want to know the moment as a function of x, um, let's say moment one as a function of x, this is not equal to m2 as a function of x. And same thing with the shear. V2 or V1 as a function of X is in equal to V2 as a function of X. Again, if we want to know anything internally about the beam, at that point we have to uh, stop using the equivalent uh, the equivalent point load procedure. It'll be useful for finding the end support, uh, the end supporting forces, but beyond that, we'll have to actually consider this and probably solve by integration or similar methods. All right, that concludes our look at uh, resultant forces, looking at uh, how we can calculate resultant forces, or at least approximately how we can calculate resultant forces. Uh, what we need to have, we need to have the uh, magnitude of the resulting forces and the location of the centroid of a resultant force. Again, resultant forces are the equivalent point loads of distributed loads on beams, columns, or other elements. And we have also looked at when we can, uh, when we can apply those and when we can't. Generally, you can apply resultant forces when you are uh, finding end supports or end support and reaction forces on beams, columns, and other elements, but you cannot use them when you are calculating uh, internal, uh, internal uh, properties or internal forces, internal stresses, that sort of thing. So if you're looking for things just at the ends of the beams where the beam can be regarded as a single rigid body, then it's perfectly adequate to use resultant forces. But if you're trying to find the shear as a function of X or the shear at some location in a beam, in that case, you'll want to consider the, uh, the distributed load as a function. All right, let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. That'll do it for now. And as always, thank you.